Good evening, comrades. A uh, very special welcome to a very special webinar tonight, a very important one. I think a, a very necessary antidote to the nauseating pro-monarchy rubbish we've all been having to put up with in the last few, I wish I could say weeks, it's months, years since, since the Jubilee, it feels like a, a non-stop assault, which is interesting because I don't think it is that uh, rock solid the support for the monarchy. I think the more they have to shove it down our throats, the, the more in trouble they are. And, and clearly um, under Charles III, the monarchy is in, in quite severe trouble and, and far from as rock solid as they make out. 30,000 police will be on the street tomorrow. Um, 250 million pounds that jamboree costs to um, crown another king, although he's already king. This is just a ceremony for, for the peasants to have something to look at. So tonight we want to have a, an, a celebration of republicanism really, and a reminder of our own radical democracy that we are putting forward and that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and other Republicans have put forward over the centuries. And it's a, it's a good reminder also, and we're not looking in detail tonight at, at Oliver Cromwell, but while we have a lot of criticism of his role in, in Ireland, et cetera, he did play a huge role in, in getting actually rid of the monarchy in the 17th century. And it was him who signed the actual, um, you know, the, 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 the command to have his head chopped off. Uh, a lot of other leaders wouldn't have probably done that. So we should, we should honor him uh, as far as it goes. Obviously there's huge criticism of him as well. So, Charles III, um, I'm just going to quickly share an, an interesting graphic that's been in the papers. Uh, that's from the from the Daily Mail, um, who've commissioned <coughs> Lords, um, something or other, um, a very right winger to do a poll on the monarchy. And this is what they found. And they, they put that on the front page as the, the support for the monarchy is rock solid. And then you take a closer look and you think, really? Rock solid? So... 18% are angry abolitionists. I think that's that's what we are with the, you know, those who say quite out loudly, you know, abolish the monarchy, etc. 19% are modern republicans, so they're they're not as mad as we are, but they understand, you know, monarchy is old fashioned, etc. And they they think that should that should go. I they're abolitionists as well. I think they count as abolitionists too. Then we have neutral pragmatists who think, you know, uh, well, you know, either or, you know, that neither I'm neither that nor that. You know, it doesn't really matter to me. It seems a bit old fashioned, probably. So these people could be convinced, I believe, quite quite easily to understand that the monarchy is not what you know. Democrats should should campaign for or should support. I, you know, the, somebody's been born to rule over us is clearly the opposite of any kind of idea of of democracy. And then you've got about forty percent of committed royalists and mainstream royalists. So this doesn't look like rock solid support to me. And more interestingly, even but I don't have that here now, was a uh, a part of the poll the day after, which sh shows that the half half the um, Commonwealth countries, if they had the right for on a referendum to decide on the monarchy, they would vote to get rid of the monarchy, which is um, a huge problem for King Charles III. So tonight we want to look at the role of monarchy in ideology as well, how important it is that the monarchy, you know, that idea that somebody can be born to be ruled over, to rule over us is part of the state, keeping the status quo. If you buy that, You'll buy anything, really. So it is a huge part of the ideology. And we want to look concretely at what Marx and Engels had to say on the matter, etc. cetera. Um, apologies first. Kevin Bean had to pull out. He's actually sick. He's got an eye infection and had to pull out uh, earlier today. But um, uh, with, with great thanks, we welcome Steve Freeman, who's uh, jumped in the breach and is will be presenting uh, part of, of tonight's introductions. And of course, at, as always, there will be time for questions and comments from the floor. So we're going to start with, Kev, uh, sorry, with Ian, who is going to take a look at the uh, historical perspective mainly. Take it away, Ian. This is um, the decapitation of Charles I in 1649. Um, 
if any of you are down in London uh, for the uh, protest against the coronation, you, just down the road from there, of course, along Whitehall, you can walk past this very spot, um, the banqueting house, which um, is the only surviving part of the Palace of Whitehall, which was the, the resident, the London residence of uh, kings and queens from 1530 to 1698. Uh, and this was, uh, this is the only surviving part of the banqueting house. Um, it was given a kind of thorough facelift in 1622 by Inigo Jones. Um, so let's have a little look at the English Revolution. Um, the picture you see here is a rather later kind of romantic image, which I think is in the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg, and it's of uh, Oliver Cromwell looking a bit cavalier there, actually. Uh, Oliver Cromwell staring into the coffin of Charles I, and uh, if you can see a bit more detail, you can see the, 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 the nice cut across the neck. Um, but it was painted by uh, Hippolyte de la Roche in uh, 1846. So the first thing I want to point out really is the debate around uh, the English revolution of the 1640s as a bourgeois revolution. Um, some people will say, well, how can it be a bourgeois revolution? Uh, Cromwell himself was a kind of landed German brother, kind of landed gentry, as it were. Um, Fairfax was a, 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 an earl. Um, how do we describe this? Or how did Marx or later Christopher Hill uh, discuss it as a bourgeois revolution? Um, Marx does mention the English Revolution in various places, often in comparison uh, with the French Revolution on, and uh, in, in debates with, with other people. And the point about it being a bourgeois revolution, of course, was that um, not so much that it was everybody who was on the parliamentary army was a member of the bourgeoisie or for that matter what little of a proletariat there was but rather that it swept away the, the last feudal impediments to capitalist accumulation it was effectively um removing the autocracy which was able to impinge upon the rights of the bourgeoisie to accumulate and accumulate as much as they want um it's, it's worth thinking about those debates around history and the English Revolution of the 1640s because of the way in which it tends to be presented as the English Civil War as somehow a part of a, a, a gradual and progressive transition from feudal monarchy through to a full liberal democracy. Um, capitalism was liberal long before it was ever democratic and what we don't see here is a sort of a, tra a transition in society which takes place by a series of steps. Uh, that's not how history moves. And that's one of the great things about reading Marx, for example, on the 18th Brumio, Louis Bonaparte, which we'll come on to in a moment. Marx, in what I like to think of is his, is his French trilogy, Class Struggles in France, the 18th Brumio, Louis Bonaparte, and then, of course, um, the Civil War in France constitutes a, a masterpiece, really, of historiography, apart from anything else. The other point about the English Revolution of the 1640s, of course, is that it represents this, the importance of, uh, of accident and necessity in history uh, from a Marxist perspective. Um, we often hear, you know, if we were talking about the, French, the, the Russian Revolution, for example, somebody will say, well, what, what would have happened if Trotsky had succeeded instead of Stalin, uh, would there have been a different outcome? We don't know, it would be purely speculative. But what I'm trying to get to really is the importance of sometimes individual acts, and but they're not individual acts outside of a context. So necessity in history, we already see the development of capitalism within the womb of feudalism. And um, by the time we get to the 1640s, much of the agriculture is no longer of a few is no longer of a feudal type there are already um enclosures of common lands which peasants had relied upon and the, that those enclosure movements accelerated after the revolution it was a, a removal of, of precisely those kinds of impediments to primitive accumulation that this, the, the english revolution constituted and why I say accident and necessity as kind of interpenetrating opposites in the movement of history, it's important because, um, you know, you could argue, one could argue that if Charles I hadn't been so stupid and actually made some concessions or hadn't been co constantly gone back on his word or 
or constantly try to rule without parliament, then maybe he, he would have kept his head and kept the crown and uh, it would have taken longer to remove those last feudal impediments. But the confrontation would have come eventually anyway. Uh, and the idea that there would have been a, a, a quiet and smooth transition from feudalism to capitalism, feudalism had already gone. I mean, what we're dealing with here is, as I say, the last feudal Im impediments. And of course, that it gives us some kind of idea about the, the future revolutions. The idea that capitalism came into being quietly, peacefully as a series of progressive steps is one of the things that's uh, rendered absurd by the hit lessons of the, of the English Revolution. So by 1660 and the restoration of Charles II, this was not a restoration of the autocracy. Uh, although Charles II was restored and retained a, a considerable amount of power, it was not the same kind of position that his father had enjoyed. And even though Charles II himself uh, tried repeatedly to um, undermine Parliament and go behind the back of Parliament, uh, it, he was never able to fully restore the autocracy that Charles I had imposed. And of course, the other aspect of the English Revolution of the 1640s, which is important from the point of view of, of, of Marxist thinking, is the left in the English Revolution. And it's something we'll see again in the French Revolution. Um, and we see the ideological expression of politics in the English Revolution as being a religious one. Gerard Wynne Stanley, for example, the true leveller, uh, uh, talked of the sin of private property. Uh, he was in, in his uh, commune that they built at St George's Hill in Surrey, uh, now a rather plush housing estate, interestingly. Um, so it finds its expression through religion because everything did. And you'll see uh, passionate debates between Presbyterians and, and those who would wish to defend um, um, the episcopy, the bishops and so on, and, and the House of Lords uh, as being expressed in religious terms. And of course, we find its poetical expression in the works of Milton. Um, so Cromwell is established as a dictator in, in 1653, and what we then see is an acceleration, really, of pr both primitive accumulation and Britain's imperialism. Um, uh, uh, Admiral Blake, of course, successfully won um, naval wars against the Dutch, who were uh, uh, one of uh, Britain's main imperialist rivals at the time. But of course, even then, um, it's not until the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688 and the deposition of James II that we finally see the culmination of a, a, a constitutional monarchy. So moving on to the, the French Revolution, the French Revolution was hugely important for Marx. And uh, there's some suggestion that around, 60, uh, around 1844, Marx was actually planning to write a history of the, of the French Revolution. And of course, um, the French Revolution was influential in that the part of Germany that was occupied by French forces in which the uh, Code Napoleon um, was applied meant that that part of Germany, in a sense, looks with um, favour upon the French Revolution. Uh, the, the idea of men, many kind of German thinkers at the time, as we'll see, uh, Hegel and Beethoven, um, Beethoven's Eroica Symphony was going to be dedicated to Napoleon until, of course, Napoleon crowned himself emperor, um, and which Beethoven regarded as a huge betrayal, as so many others did. Um, so it, Marx was influenced not only by the revolution in France as a bourgeois revolution in, in the same way that uh, the English Revolution was, but also took great interest in the competing uh, groups within, uh, within the French Revolution, within the Constituent Assembly, for example, um, and, and who they represented. The Montagne, as it were, uh, representing the sans culotte and uh, the poorer sections of a French society. And when you read Marx's historical works, you get this constant sense of an awareness of the of the power of competing groups and the part that therefore monarchy can play. Um, monarchy can play a, a powerful representative force within the context of historical movement. Um, so, looking at revolution and counter-revolution in France. And Marx at one point in the 18th Brumaire talks about the way in which revolutions 
hesitate, move, uh, and, and and often change course, as it were. What we see, of course, is that there was in the French Revolution, as there was in the English Revolution, a left wing. But of course, in neither England nor France, could, can we talk about a, a developed uh, proletariat that could possibly have taken power? But what we see is that proletariat exerts its influence in, in alliance with other groups within uh, Britain and, and France, respectively. So revolution and counter-revolution is part of not only a, 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 the dialectics of, of the revolutionary movement at the time, but it also constitutes part of the dialectic of world history. Um, from a Hegelian point of view, uh, there's a tendency on the part of uh, human history to move in the direction of freedom. And it's one of the most important aspects of the, Hegel's influence upon Marx is that Hegel sees a movement in history, although Hegel is often regarded as a, a rather conservative figure because he saw um, the, the, the Prussian state, as it were, as an expression of reason and of the world spirit. Um, Marx, of course, it was precisely that aspect of Marx, uh, that, uh, precisely that aspect of Hegel that Marx criticised. It was part of a dialectic of world history, taking us in a direction of freedom. Uh, and of course, uh, subject to accident and necessity in history, uh, socialism isn't inevitable, it has to be fought for. Um, and of course, if we're also facing World War Three, that represents another possible uh, direction. So, uh, and Napoleon, of course, uh, is fascinating in this respect. Um, as I said, uh, Beethoven was going to dedicate the Eroica Symphony to him. Uh, and he was really expressing something which was widespread in Germany at the time. Here is this famous quote from Hegel in 1806. I saw the emperor, this world soul, riding out on reconnaissance. It is indeed a wonderful sensation to see such an individual concentrated here at a single point, astride a horse, reaches out over the world and conquers it. Um, so a, a simple artillery officer, fairly low status, although minor Spanish, uh, minor Italian nobility, uh, France had not long acquired Corsica uh, as, a, as a junior Artillery officer, he showed a brilliant aplomb in, for example, the defense of Toulon. Uh, and of course, uh, later on, when we talk about the 18th Brumier of Louis Bonaparte, uh, this is a reference, of course, to Napoleon's usurpation of power as uh, it moved from the uh, convention through to the, uh, the consulate. So there were three consuls, but it, Napoleon was the, the first consul uh, from 1799 uh, and, and declared so on the um, the 18th Brumier of year eight of the French revolutionary calendar. Uh, Brumier is the month of fogs. Um, so ninth of, that corresponds to the 9th of, uh, of November 1799. An emperor of the French rather than emperor of France or for, uh, emperor of Italy or whatever he later was declared uh, king of Italy of course as well. So Marx, of course, rather than writing about monarchy as such, he's writing about particular moments. He's writing about, so the, 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 the series of, of articles that were, I think, published in the Neue Rheinische Zeitung um, in between 16, 40, uh, 1848 and 1850, um, and were later subsequently published by Engels in uh, uh, 1895, I believe, 1894. Um, uh, 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 in in pump, in pamphlet form as in book form, and was concerned with um, the, the taking Louis Philippe of Orléans. Uh, the, the Orléanists represented a kind of a minor branch, as it were, of the Bourbon dynasty. Um, and here we, we see his uh, was known as sometimes as the Citizen King. He had been in a situation. He'd fought, for example, in the um, uh, Napoleonic Wars, uh, uh, the, the, the wars defending the French Revolution, uh, but but did, but left to live in England after the execution of Louis the Sixteenth, um, and later uh, after the defeat of the Bourbon King Charles the Tenth, uh, took power in eighteen thirty. 
Um, and here in the context of, uh, again, street fighting involving different um, sections of French society, uh, poor people were only too happy to get rid of the, an unpopular Bourbon, Bourbon king, uh, sometimes known as the legitimists. Um, but of course, uh, Louis Philippe himself, what Marx argues is that the, the, the conflict that was taking place wasn't really a revolution from below of working people, but a revolution that was being carried out between different sections of the ruling class. Uh, Louis Philippe of Orléans effectively represented uh, finance capital, finance capital and th those people who would gain from the building of railways, for example, um, uh, and uh, against um, industrial capital proper, as it were, forming as it was in France. So you have a, 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 a divided ruling class between uh, finance and industrial capital. And really, Louis-Philippe of Orléans represents um, uh, th that finance capital. Oh. So... Louis Philippe's uh, reign was was fairly disastrous for the for the for the French working class. Uh, by eighteen thirty two, there were uprisings because of uh, um, poverty, and and later on, uh, uh, because of outbreaks of cholera. Um, Marx later writes on writes about the uh, economic crisis in England uh, and beyond uh, that was effectively led. Uh, to the downfall of Louis Philippe, and Louis Philippe ab abdicated in 1848, and the Second Republic was declared uh, with um, the nephew of, of Napoleon Bonaparte um, initially uh, becoming president within the context of the Second Republic, then declaring himself president for life, and then Emperor Napoleon III in 1852. And in the preface to the class struggle in France, um, in the preface to the 18th Brumaire, Marx writes, the class struggle in France created circumstances and relationships that made it possible for a grotesque mediocrity to play a hero's part. Um, it's a, an interesting illustration about the way in which history, we, we, the way in which history is presented is, is the actions of great men and women, usually men, who, the actions of great people, uh, when in fact it's the historical movement that actually creates their greatness, as it were. And then, of course, famously, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under the circumstances of already existing and transmitted from the past. So this important idea, again, coming back to notions of an uh, accident and necessity in history, that um, the conditions are there for the for the transformation in society. Uh, what's required then is, um, in, in a sense, the, the, the leadership and what can play a part is, for example, the mediocrity of Louis Bonaparte, leading ultimately to the, the disaster at the Battle of Sedan in 1870, and eventually uh, the Paris Commune of 1870 to 1871, which radically transformed Marx's conception of what the possibility of socialism would be. And then let's not forget our own uh, dear royal family. What I find so fascinating about the present, of course, is that the idea that somehow uh, Charles III represents some kind of benign transition, as uh, uh, Tina has already pointed out, uh, the popularity of the current king is nothing like uh, the preceding monarch. Um, if one compares the television coverage of uh, 1953, uh, which I remember my mum telling me about, Everybody, uh, there was there was hardly any dissent in 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 1953. Uh, by contrast to the present, where there will be considerable amounts of dissent and very little interest, I think overall. Um, but let's also forget not forget that the, the current monarchy actually plays a, an important role. Uh, um, um, for that reason, any any anyone who regards themselves as a socialist has also to want to be rid of the monarchy. You know, Edward VIII here uh, teaching his. Um, nieces to give Nazi salutes, um, was known to be a Nazi sympathizer, was known to have given uh, secrets to Nazi Germany uh, while he was, uh, and that was one of the reasons why he was shunted off to become governor of Bermuda 
uh, he was unreliable in in a, in a military uh, uh, capacity. Um, the, the royal prerogative was used to oust Gough Whitlam, Gough Whitlam as, uh, as Prime Minister of Australia in, in 1975. But perhaps its most pervasive uh, and, and dangerous uh, aspect of the royal family is as ideology. And, and part of that is this whole invention of tradition. You know, tomorrow uh, on Saturday, we'll see the nauseating spectacle of, um, uh, of, of, of things which claim to be a great historical uh, precedent. I remember very well uh, the investiture of uh, King Charles III as Prince of Wales. And they came up with this whole stuff uh, of, of he pledges allegiance to his, the, his majesty as the, my liege lords, blah, blah. And uh, this was all nonsense. I mean, prior to uh, George V, um, for the most part, uh, investiture as, uh, as Prince of Wales was a sort of quiet private affair. It was, and uh, the current Prince of Wales, of course, was, was, was just uh, made Prince of Wales quietly. It was done as a, for a particular political reason because of the growth of Welsh nationalism at the time. And that was the importance of having it at Carnarvon Castle and the importance of that whole uh, absurd charade. And it continues to play that position today. And of course, let's not forget um, that the current king is also the head of the Church of England. Um, uh, there was an interesting, I was watching the news just before we started and uh, this, you know, they made great play about the fact that uh, people from different faiths will be presenting things to the king during the course of the coronation. There's nothing new in this. The great Durbar uh, uh, of 19, uh, was it 1910 um, in India, the whole streams of Maharajas were presenting themselves uh, to, to King Edward the, the, the Seventh. Uh, there's, there's, there's nothing very unusual about it, but the idea of this um, invention of tradition is an important part of the of the of the continued uh, ideological control. And of course, they still do exert a political influence. However, mercifully, uh, I would argue that the monarchy is in decline. But to a certain extent, capitalism is not dependent upon it, as we see here. Look, this is the sun. Uh, we, talking about, um, you know, they've made a whole story from this one leaked photograph of Edward VIII uh, teaching his daughters to give fascist salutes. Um, and of course, you can see why uh, Edward VIII would be interested in such a thing. Um, George V, of course, was all too conscious of the, uh, of, of the fate of, of Tsar Nicholas II and so on. But, you know, the, the bourgeoisie could quite easily do away with the monarchy and uh, and if the monarchy ever stepped out of line, would do so. Uh, but nevertheless, they do play a, a, an important part at the moment. And we would regard uh, the abolition of the monarchy and the declaration of a republic as a very positive step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, that reminded me the mention of the sun that uh, it's quite interesting to the in the current news that uh, Prince Harry is suing the sun, the mail and the mirror. And it transpires that the royal family has a longstanding deal with the sun and other newspapers, but particularly with the sun, that they keep quiet uh, about any criticisms. You know, they, the, uh, the, sun, the sun supports the monarchy and in return, the royal family won't sue them for having hacked their phones and other things like that. So they have a there's a deal to to support the monarchy because as as you just showed it wasn't always so and it doesn't it doesn't always have to be like that it it makes sense from a from a you know capitalist you know purely capitalist point of view to get get rid of it it serves no particular purpose um, apart from the ideological purpose so they can easily turn against the monarchy that is an interesting development I think that we've recently seen thank you very much Ian for this um, historic. Um, overview and what Marx and, and Engels wrote wrote on the issue. I think it's really important to discuss the um that you criticize the the the, the move of history, which is important because if you if you learn history from you know something like the, the communist parties, you'll you'll usually get, you know, you got slavery and then you got feudalism and it's sort of history goes like that and it has to end with socialism, communism, which uh, you know, if only, but that is not the case. That's not how history moves quite quite differently. The, the agency is hugely important. Okay, I'm over to Steve now. Welcome, comrade, and thank you for uh, jumping in at short short notice. You're still muted, I think. 
thank you thank you tina uh, and thank you ian as well for getting us up on the right track there um i, I wanted to um just begin obviously i'll begin with the coronation before going backwards into history a little bit but not not quite where ian's gone i think i won't go back much before the 19th century but uh but but ian's right to go back to the 17th century i hasten to add at this point uh where 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 we get all our clues from um i wanted to say that uh just as i begin that we, the republican labor education forum has done a blog on the coronation and i hope we will be able to circulate it then you'll get a slightly more detailed understanding of what we what we're going to say and one of the things on that we're saying is everybody go to trafalgar square at about 10 o'clock on saturday morning if you're especially if you're in london um, apparently a new law has been passed quickly signed by the king which is giving the police some extra powers and they even sent um, a letters warning letters to the very mild-mannered organization called republic that is probably leading the protest in, in, in trafalgar square so um with that in mind, I think I would uh, um, say, of course, that the coronation just reminds me, I think there are two things, a bit of history and a bit of democracy almost. The, the coronation reminds me of an election when you've only got one candidate and when they've won and they get crowned when they've won, then they've got a job for life. I, I, I was thinking, well, that's a bit like, that's a bit like some sort of Stalinist model of democracy we've got going here, you know, perhaps Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un will have this in North Korea, waving little flags with synchronized marching. So we might be a country that is literally falling apart, like a degenerated social monarchy. But at least we're better than North Korea. And, and some may say we're, we are be the best in the world when it comes to pomp and pageantry and dressing up in silly clothes. And so there's all this uh, excitement being um, generated in the run-up to the coronation on Saturday, I thought I would I would uh, put up my first uh, my first slide. I think if I could, Tina, I'm going to do a bit of screen sharing there. You should be able to. Yeah, I should be able to. I think it's there, and I think I'll do that. Okay, so here's my first uh, bit of screen sharing. I suppose if I do that, it'll go um, it'll go like that. I thought to myself that in order to before we can really unite, we've got to draw some lines of demarcation, as it were. So the first one that I wanted to just draw, not controversial one, I think it's useful to start thinking in there, to draw a line between the ideological and the constitutional components of this question. We often tend to think the monarchy is just ideological. It's about history, values, culture, deference, and class society. And we often think of it in those terms as if the constitutional aspects weren't important. So I really want to argue that the constitutional aspects, which are about laws, government, the ruling class, the rule of law, power um, and force, and how we're ruled and who makes laws. I say the constitutional aspects tend to be ignored by and large, and we tend to talk a lot about the ideological aspect of this, which is, which is absolutely fine. So I thought I'd start with history as the first one on there. So, so we, we'll hear that it's about a thousand years of history. I so said a thousand years of history, it takes you back to 1066. So I was just looking up uh, 1066. And um, there was, uh, after William had landed and um, killed loads and loads of people in the southeast of England, there, there was a rebellion in 1069. Uh, and William uh, in 1069 invaded the north of England but the land between York and Durham. And it said that when he got there, he spared nobody. Men, women, children, animals, buildings, even plants, everything was annihilated in a hundred miles worth uh, of uh, area of land. So, you know, William the, William the Bastard, as he was called, right? And that's just one of many, but we might as well start with this crime. So if we're thinking of monarchy, we should be thinking a lot of crime and the crime of robbery and the crime of exploitation. So that's what we're really celebrating. And I, I noticed The Guardian had a very interesting uh, series, including talking about the role of the monarchy in slavery. So it's a thousand years of crime and murder and robbery and exploitation and murdering each other as well a lot of the time. You know, that's, that's the reality. All of which, of course, the celebrations are designed to really 
uh, gloss, uh, gloss over that. I, thinking of the ideological part of it, uh, th no, thinking of the constitutional part of it, I thought I might just mention at this point the oath, the coronation oath, this thing that's, that's uh, been thrown out has caused a bit of a storm. So they came up with a great wheeze, which was uh, we would all swear an oath of a uh, coronation oath, which says there, I'll just move this a bit because I can't even see my uh, I swear to pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Now, of course, it, that's not the only... Tony Benn points out in his book on the monarchy, uh, he makes this point, and it's absolutely true, that he says um, that uh, underpinning the constitutional arrangements of the crown is a hidden is the hidden written constitution, he says, a network of ancient tribal oaths of allegiance to the crown. Everyone with British nationality is subject and is subject of the crown, bound, bound by personal obligation of loyalty to the monarch. The betrayal of that duty can, in certain circumstances, constitute the offence of high treason attracting the death penalty. So what uh, Ben points out is MPs, ministers, members of the armed forces are all swearing these oaths of allegiance and we don't think oh well it doesn't really matter you can put your fingers behind you you know cross your fingers and it'll be okay ben argues that this is where the real power relations are hidden in our constitution and the, below i've put there the, if you want to become a british citizen this is what you have to do you have to swear this i and you put your name in there do solemnly sincerely and truly declare and affirm that on becoming a British citizen, I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to his majesty, King Charles III, his heirs and successors according to law. I will give my loyalty to the United Kingdom and respect its rights and freedoms. Now, if you want to be a British citizen, you have to sign up for that. It's not like we, we don't have to necessarily sign up to the, obviously to the coronation oath, and most people just refuse point blank to do so. But MPs, lords, everybody in, if you like, the political class, Privy councillors, um, Jeremy Corbyn had to sign, had to take the oath of the Privy Council. By the way, I don't think you actually swear it. I think it's given to you. You just stand there and it's read out to you. And then you're agreed to have, uh, you have uh, done that. So beneath our constitution is this network of uh, power. And, it, and the, the Queen, of course, says to the Privy Council, if you know anything, at all about anything, you must tell me, be prepared to tell me about it. You, you mustn't hide anything. No privy councillor should hide anything from their monarch. So oaths are, I think, a very important part of our constitution. Um, I then wanted to make a couple more points, I think. I mean, obviously, I, I, I think the point that Tina made at the beginning is important. We are divided as a country between the royalists the entire political class, the loyalists, civil servants, lords, armed forces, and all that section of the population that see themselves as monarchists and loyalists and royalists. You've got the mass of people in the middle who are really indifferent, uh, maybe critical, not ready to do anything about it, don't mind a day off work, will enjoy having a party, etc., etc. And then you have this Republican minority, which is about 25 to 30%, but it's higher amongst young people. Um, they're, they're not yet ready to form themselves into a Republican Party. And as I always keep making the point, if, if, if there's no Republican Party, it basically means there is no class in our society that sees its interest in actually getting rid of the monarchy. Not at the level as the Jacobins and the Bolsheviks that were um, Republican parties. So from the Oath of Allegiance, I wanted to go on next to simply talk about, I think, a very important distinction. Uh, oh, two very important, two, two very important distinctions, okay. The first one is the distinction that you have to make, I think, between the crown and the king. And these two words are used, king and crown or monarch and crown, are used interchangeably. But the best way to draw that dividing line is to think that the king is a one-man firm. He's not really one-man business. He's not. It's called the firm. 
it could be called the palace. So when we hear the, being talked about the palace, we know it's, uh, it's uh, King Charles and his business. We could call it, if we wanted, Royal Enterprises Limited. And it's got about a thousand people working for it. So doing, but, you know, butlers and cooks and goodness knows what else. This is quite different to the crown. The crown is a corporate entity, like a, peer, like a public limited company. It's like a large multinational corporation. It's got a board of directors. It's got thousands and thousands of middle managers and it's got up to 4 million workers. It's a very, it is probably the most powerful body in the country. You know, it's um, busily uh, possibly gonna lock up Tony Greenstein in the next week or two. I, we're obviously gonna be fighting to make sure that doesn't happen. But the Crown is a very powerful body. And by mixing the two up, if we, think, if we just think about the King, we think, well, he, he doesn't do much. He's just, it's just ideological. He's got no role in this. But if you think about this powerful body called the crown, which is really another way of talking about the state. So we don't really have the state in our laws, but we do have the crown busily in our laws. And the crown therefore is not the same as the king. Uh, and it's very important to make that distinction. And so uh, just to make the next point, that we as Republicans okay, are much more interested in the crown than we are in the king. That might seem a bit odd at first, but when you look into it, you'll see why that is the case. And then I think I'll take my third point really here, which is that there is a difference between being an anti-monarchist and being a Republican. Uh, Anti-monarchists, there's a range of people that are against the monarchy, liberals, greens, anarchists, left socialists, Marxists, Anti-monarchism tends to focus on the king. What's wrong with Charles? How much money? Well, all the waste, the costs, the person, his personality and all those things. Is he a good guy, a bad guy? Is he corrupt and all, all, all issues like that? And the organization Republic focuses on that yellow side of it. It applies a yellow color anyway. It's essentially more, much more anti-monarchist organization. Democratic Republicans, on the other hand, is quite different. And I've put Marx in the category of being a Democratic Republican, by the way. But for Democratic Republicans, what we focus on is on democracy, on sovereignty, it says form, it should be from below, on rights, on having a democratic constitution, having people elected accountable, subject to recall. That is the Democratic Republican program, and it's quite different. Monarchists are against, anti-monarchists are against the monarchy, but democratic republicans are arguing for an alternative. And that's a very, again, a very important uh, distinction. So as democratic republicans, we focus on the crown. We look to those four million workers who are working for the crown, by the way. We look to the idea that the crown could be democratized if, if workers, if the workers, those working for the crown could uh, organize themselves to, as it were, to, to take that over. Now, so with those distinctions in mind, uh, which I think are really important, most of the left are anti-monarchists, they're not Republicans, not what I'd call Republicans, um, and, and they don't draw that clear distinction between the, uh, the monarch or the king and the crown, which I think is important. My next point, I think, was now to go back into history a little bit. I'll go back to the 19th century. Um, I was looking up a, an article written in 1844 by, by Engels. Uh, it's called The Position of England, the British Constitution. And it was published in uh, the Vorts, and it's in a book uh, on Marx and Engels' articles on Britain. And Engels says this, and it's an observation, but I think it's an important observation. That's why I picked on this one point. It says, the British constitution cannot exist without the monarchy. Okay, it can't exist without the monarchy. He says, remove the crown, and he, which he calls the subjective apex, and the entire artificial structure collapses. He says, the British constitution, it's a detailed analysis, this article of the British Constitution, by the way. The British Constitution is an inverted pyramid. The apex is at the same time the base. Now I was thinking, well, what the hell does that mean? Okay, that's, that's, we've got 
subjective apexes and the apex is the base and we've got inverted pyramids. So I thought, well, I'll try and put it into a diagrammatic form. So I thought this is what it could be. Here's the first slide and it's probably both of these. If you could think of our constitution being like this, you've got the monarch sat on the very pinnacle of it. And then you could imagine that triangle at the very bottom is the working class. In the middle of that triangle is the middle classes. And then you're moving up to the bourgeoisie and the upper classes and the aristocracy with the monarchy, with the monarch at the very pinnacle of the, uh, of the thing. And if you think of our constitution like that, you could think, well, OK, we could just knock the top bit off, couldn't we? We could just remove the monarch and all the rest of it would stay the same. We just wouldn't have the little bit at the top, like we'd remove the fairy from the top of the Christmas tree. OK, and you might rightly say, well, what's the point in doing that? It, it, nothing really will have changed if you just knock the bit off the top and everything else stays the same. What's the point in it? Why bother doing that? And I think that's how most people see it. But Engel's point is this, which is a different thing. Engel's point is this. It, the monarch, he says, it's like an inverted triangle, which, uh, which the apex is at the same time the base. So what he's telling us here is, in a sense, the British constitution actually rests on the monarch. It's, it's wrong to think of it just sitting at the top of the tree. The whole thing rests on the monarch. And he says the British Constitution is an inverted pyramid. And if you, uh, if you uh, remove the crown, the monarchy, he's not making this distinction I made between monarch and crown, but that's another argument. Here's using the word crown and monarch as if they're the same thing. If you, if you remove the crown, the entire artificial structure falls down. So as democratic republicans we want to have the idea of having a democratic republic as an alternative to a constitutional monarchy so does that mean we're not bothered about the monarch yes we are because we want to get rid of the monarch not not in a sense of itself because it's the beginning of the transformation or the creation of a democratic republic an alternative so we, like other anti-monarchists, we Republicans want to get rid of the monarchy, but it's because it opens the door to the kind of democratic transformation of the state to replace the existing state with a democratic uh, republic, uh, which is what our program is essentially about. And then I think, Tina, for my final point, I will come to this, that um, uh, I'm, I'm coming back to the idea of citizen Marx that we've mentioned before. I'm mentioning Bruno Leopold. He's got a forthcoming book. He's done a detailed analysis of this. On Monday, the 15th of May, we've got Bruno going to speak to us, and I hope everybody here will come and listen to what he has to say. But his essential thesis is this, uh, and I think it's a, a very important one. He, he says, he argues in detail with uh, many, many quotes. Some of, some of, some of us have read read the work, is that Marx begins in 1843, 1844 as a Republican. He's not yet a communist. And then he goes over, he kind of he leaves it, he doesn't really reject his Republicanism, but he pushes it aside and becomes much more of a communist. That's where his emphasis. And then as he does that, he's putting emphasis on property, on the ownership of property and the ownership of capital. And that's because he's developing his ideas on capital. But even when it comes to 1848, republicanism still plays a very, very important, the 1848 revolution. So even though it's hardly mentioned in the Communist Manifesto, in the 1848 revolutions, Marx is fighting for republicanism in Germany. And then a little bit later on, he continues to be a Republican, by the way, and that's why he's interested in Ireland. That's why he's interested in the Polish national question. Uh, that's why he supports an organization in this country called the Land and Labour League, which is a Republican organization. That's why he's very sympathetic to the Chartists. And then when it comes to the overthrow of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte by the, uh, in the Franco-German War in 1870, and then we have the emergence of the Paris Commune, Marx goes to this, sees it straight away as the kind of republicanism, the kind of genuinely democratic republicanism. And he sees this is like the, the missing piece in his jigsaw, because in the Paris Commune, you have the idea of a democracy 
in which everybody is elected, accountable, subject to recall and paid the average wage. And that's what I think we Democratic Republicans uh, uh, insist upon. So uh, just to finish on this point, Tina, is a big difference between just being an anti-monarchist and being against uh, a rotten and corrupt monarchy, which we all are, and being in positively in favour of democracy. The, the argument that we may want to make as Republicans is basically a democratic argument. And that's, that, that democratic argument takes us on the road towards socialism and communism. So, um, and, and, and just to remind you of the point that to really understand what we're dealing with, we're dealing with the crown rather than just the monarch. The monarch is important because the monarch links, the, we couldn't have a, we couldn't have a crown without having a king, by the way. So if the king was, was abolished, the crown would be in a hell of a mess without having a king. But anyway, that's another story. So um, yes, Tina, I think I, I will now stop sharing and go back to somewhere. And Thank you very much. Over. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ian. I think that was a really good, good overview, overview. And I think it's really important actually to stress that point. Who is... Who would be winning this this abolition of the monarchy isn't it that's a huge problem i mean it's you know you look at germany you look at america they are republics they don't have a king they don't have a monarchy are they really that more democratic than britain not by itself israel is a is a republic you know the the democracy in the middle east and it is of course not more democratic but um and i want to ask you both about this because i believe um Marx wrote something along the lines of uh, the democratic republic is the form of the worker state. And that's why we're fighting for it, in that it, it is part of the democratic program for socialism. Uh, Ian, do you know any, any more about that? Can you, can you enlighten us a bit more about that? I think that distinction between what Steve talks about as a, as a, a social republic, as distinct from a bourgeois republic is an important one. But I suppose I would have tempted the view that socialism would, of course, inherently be democratic and naturally would not have a king. Well, it would be absurd. Um, but perhaps more importantly, uh, the idea of a, a republic implies the possibility at least of not only the continued existence of capitalism if you have capitalism then the political form that that, that the, the republic has historically been the, the political form taken by uh, the republic has been the, the political form taken by capitalism and that doesn't just isn't just about how the state is organized isn't just about how the bureaucracy is organized it implies a whole range of other things such as the way in which human beings relate to one another at, at the most fundamental level. Um, capitalism requires uh, 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 the vast majority of the population to own nothing but themselves and people relate to one another through the market. Uh, the whole point about um, abstract labour, of course, is that everything is universalised. That's why the, the importance of the citizen in discussing the Republic is, is so important. A citizen owns his or herself, uh, because they have to, because they, they, they sell themselves in, in the marketplace. And everything in all relations between human beings then take a contractual form, which presupposes their separation. So whilst I, I take Steve's point about the importance of a social republic as opposed to a bourgeois republic, I would argue that the once you get to the point of socialism, you're looking at something which is, which is you know, different again, you know, Hegel's whole idea of the movement towards socialism, the ultimate culmination of what it is to be truly human, is socialism or communism. Uh, I'm happy with either term. As you know, I prefer the term communism. But it, <clears throat> from that point of view, all human relations become direct and personal, not mediated through a contractual form which presupposes their separation. So from that point of view, the Republic, the res publica, the idea of a... a, a, a a, 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 an association through a foundation of law that would be superseded by a communist society mm -hmm. where uh, you, you have ultimately the administration of things rather than the administration of people. It's also um, 
of course, um, some socialists or socialist organizations don't actually have the abolition of the monarchy, House of Lords, or any of those things in their program. Or if they do, it's like, well, well down. Whereas I think it is a huge, it should play a huge part in, in the campaign, the program of any socialist organization, because it also changes us in the process, doesn't it? If Unless the working class takes this fight seriously, this is how we're ruled. This is, goes, as, as Steve has you know, explained very well, I think how the widespread and integral the, the crown is to, to Britain. Unless we take that seriously and bring it into our program for socialism, we're unlikely to get there unless we take those questions seriously. Um, I'm going to bring in some comrades now from, from the floor. Sudi was the first one with her hand up. Welcome. You're still muted. There you go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Tina. My question is uh, to Steve and um, is not related to the uh, uh, um, point in, uh, in hand. This is the second time I noticed that Steve, when it comes, the issue of Privy Council comes into the matter, into uh, talk, he brings Jeremy Corbyn up. Jeremy Corbyn, as a leader of the opposition, by common law, becomes part of the Privy Council, whether he liked it or he didn't like it. He receives lots of uh, smear and uh, through, from the right wing TV people, even uh, PLP. Uh, I think that uh, the left should be a bit more respectful and understand that he is a part of the Privy Council, but it is out of his choice. Thank that was my, my, my take. Thank you, comrade. Steve, do you want to reply straight away? Well, it, I mean, fair enough. It, it wasn't a choice, by the way. He became leader of the opposition. He has to, because that's our constitution. He no, didn't this really is have, what I'm saying. Yeah, he didn't, he have, didn't a choice. have it. Well, he does have a choice. No, he but, doesn't. If, well, of As course. As leader of the opposition, he becomes the member of the Privy Council. Not automatic. He has got to go somewhere and do it. He could say he's not going to do that. He could have said that, but that would have created a whole problem. But he didn't stand as a Republican, even though he is a Republican, by the way. Jeremy yeah, Corbyn, but... Jeremy Corbyn is a Republican. He stated so. He was he was the person who signed um, a Tony Benn's bill back in 1993. So he uh, and he was attacked, by the way, back in 2016 by the press saying, you know, for, uh, well, what a hypocrite you are. You say you're a Republican and you've gone and, uh, and, and joined the Privy Council. He was on a contradictory position. So I'm agreeing with you, really. He's in, he's so in I'm a glad that position. you're mentioning these. Yeah. So I, I ask you, just as you know, so, so, please don't okay. bring his name all the time that he's part of the Privy no, Council. He's not is, even here. So no, he's... Okay, he's a, he's, a, he's a privy councillor, and that was his position. But what I, I think what I'm asking you is don't, not about... You didn't no, mention Tony well, Benn. Let well, him answer, comrade. Well, Tony Benn also... I think Tony Benn would also have been a privy councillor, by the way, because he was a minister of the Crown, and every minister of the Crown has to become a privy council. They have to join. It's the third parliament. We've got three parliaments in this country. The privy council is the kings. We've got the lords. We've got the commons. We've got a three parliament system. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what? So so what? But okay. But my point is not what a bad person is Jeremy Corbyn. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you don't have a, a republic, if you don't stand as a republican and put forward a republican approach to all these questions, then you get caught up in the network of power and compromises that lead you into a dead end. And he was going into that dead end. That's what I'm saying. It I'm not a problem. So it's, I, it, I mean, I'm a great supporter of Jeremy Corbyn, but look, he 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 got compromised. He was compromised by by, by at least by this as well, among other things. Mm. Yeah, okay. but what I'm saying is that why you bring only his name up? Well, didn't I just brought? But I, mentioned, I, mentioned, I mentioned I mentioned Tony Benn, because, and the reason why I'm bringing no, it up. Didn't. Okay, 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 okay. 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 But, okay let me let me answer your question then. Okay, let me just answer your question. The reason I'm bringing it up is because he was the leader of the Labour Party. He was the people, he was the person everybody was following. And if we want to analyse what went wrong, 
and why we, he didn't succeed and what went wrong, we have to understand how he gets caught up in this network of power in which he himself gets caught up in. Okay. And that, that's a problem that he didn't discuss with us or anybody before that. He just went, went into it. So I'm only picking on him because he's a, he's a, he's a leader of the movement in the last few years. Yep. Let's let's move on from this. Sorry, sorry, Sudhir. We have got a few people with their hands up. Sorry, we'll have to um, get over that. Uh, as Ian put in the in the chat, I think quite rightly, any workers' representative faces the dilemma of oath of allegiance. I mean, Sinn Fein does it. Um, well, they they don't, they you don't know, do it. their seats. You could, you know, you do that with your thing behind your hand. I mean, there's different ways to 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 deal with it. It's it's a question, isn't it? It's, it's a tactical question. Is it worth? going into the parliament and representing and using it as a platform or do you have your you know your honor or whatever you can't possibly swear an oath i mean it's a it's a it's a question what you do with that position i guess um okay uh john uh john can't uh, doesn't have a camera but you can speak now comrade thank you um thank you very much stephen and uh, ian for uh, uh, a very uh, informative and um uh, eye opening in, in many cases, um, um, uh, um, contribution or the leader, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, um, the Privy Council, um, what you were saying, Steve, about Privy Council and uh, Corbyn and so on, I think I was interested to hear you say every minute. Sorry, you know, the, the, the actual um, uh, sign up for the Privy Council. Um, so are we saying here that every MP has to sign up for the Privy Council? Or is it just ministers uh, as such? And is, I mean, Corbyn, yes, it's true, Corbyn wasn't a minister before. He only became a minister when he became the leader. But that's true. So, that's beginning to make more sense now. I can see. Yeah. So, ministers are the Amen. people who have to sign up. Mm. Um, if you just comment, ministers are automatically have to be privy council, but then the leader of the opposition and certain other people, I don't, I don't know the full details of it, also have to be in the privy council. And they, right. get, they get to hear all the what's going on behind the scenes. The, the leader of the opposition mm. and the prime minister meet in there and discuss yeah. the wars that are going on that we don't know about. Yeah, this is the thing. Um, I was reading an article a while back, I've forgotten where I actually saw it, but it was about the fact that the Privy Council, um, any laws that, you know, because any laws before, before they go to Parliament are seen by the Privy Council. And this article was pointing out that the Privy Council has to consult the Queen about any of those laws, and if the Crown are not happy with that, not happy with some of those laws, um, that they can be amended uh, before they actually go to Parliament. Um, I was reading this article a while back, so I, was saying, I, I don't actually can't remember the source. But is there any truth in that? Yeah. That the actual, um, you know, any, a law can actually be amended by the Crown, which and the Privy Council is part of. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say the amend. other thing. Okay. Yeah, I'll just go carry on. Um, yeah, and, wind up a bit, dog comrade, if you could. Yeah, yeah, I am that. So I was also reading recently about the fact that whilst the Queen, after the death of the Queen, there was a service in memory of her, and apparently, whilst this service was going on, um. 100 employees of the Crown were made redundant uh, whilst it was actually going on. Um, and the other thing is that I was really quite amazed to find out that there's 4 million um, actual employees of the Crown. Does that actually include, you know, your ordinary civil servants or, or so on? Anyhow, that's it. Thank you, Jeff. Do you want to reply straight away, Steve, or shall we collect some questions? 
quick collection. I mean, that's a quick answer just to say that the Queen, the Queen or, or the King now, it's called Queen's Consent, I think. So anything, before any bill goes before Parliament, the Queen gets to have a look at it and see if there's anything that's going to adversely affect her. And then there's the Royal Assent, which is before anything's signed into law, the Queen signs, you know, the, the Queen has to sign everything into law. So there's two different things going on there. The Royal Assent and Queen's Consent. Okay, we've got Tony with us. While he can still speak in our meetings, let's hear him. Hello, comrade. You need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah, actually the Queen doesn't have to put actual, uh, personally sign uh, into law. Assent is automatic. Uh, that's one correction. Uh, the second thing is, you're right on Corbyn, uh, he didn't automatically become a member of the Privy Council, he had to swear an oath of allegiance and I think uh, kneel or do something in private with the Queen anyway, but I'm not sure what. Uh, I'm not even sure that all ministers become Privy Councillors, I think it's the Cabinet, but I may be wrong on that, but I don't think it's all ministers. But the point of a, the Crown is, it's a symbol of the power of the British state, and it's a British capitalist state, although it has a feudal form, uh, the crown is important because it mystifies power. Instead of seeing uh, rapacious capitalists like you will in America, uh, holding uh, the gun, if you like, to the president, uh, in this country, it's, uh, it's the crown, which is uh, this kind of mystification that Walter Bajto and others uh, another constitutionalist argued about in the 19th century and that we shouldn't let light in, in on it because then the, its power would uh, dissipate. And I think that's actually part of the problem of the present British monarchy and the, the rise of republicanism is that people no longer hold it in the esteem that they would have done half a century ago. But what is what is the main fault of the monarchy? Because the British state, in essence, is no more undemocratic uh, than the United States, for instance. I mean, we have a, a king, they have a president who's got the, all the powers of a king. Uh, we have a House of Lords, but then they have an unelected Supreme Court, which actually has more power in many ways. So uh, the idea that a republic is inherently more progressive, I don't think really stands up. It's certainly when it, you're talking about a bourgeois uh, republic uh but nonetheless in this country and the monarchy also it symbolizes the kind of politics of deference uh that people uh, defer to uh, as uh, subjects not citizens so it's important from a democratic point of view that we should get rid of the monarchy and because the process of getting rid of it in itself will imply social change uh I, I really leave uh, it uh, as that. Uh, as regards Steve's social versus socialist uh, republic, uh, I I don't see what a social republic can be other than a socialist republic. Otherwise, what you're talking about is a social republic under capitalism, and that in itself, I think, is a contradiction in terms. So, uh, yeah, I will leave it at that, having made a few observations. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, shall we collect a few more, or does either of you want to come in? We should, we should hear from more comrades, maybe a little bit. Let's do that. Okay. Um, Paul, please. Oh, sorry, got the wrong one. Paul first, and then Larry. You, Paul France, you can speak now. Oh, you want me to speak? Yeah, well, you indicated you wanted to speak. <laughs> well, give me a thumbs up. Oh, you didn't want to speak. That's I think you put your hand up, which means I want to speak. Put a thumbs up for, for... Right. Okay, then I'll uh, take you off then. And Larry, you can come in. Thank you, Tina. And um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm getting a bit of feedback here. I'm sorry for. Are you hearing the feedback? No, um, no, we can hear you perfectly. Oh, that's right. It's just my problem then. Um, the, the opportunity to discuss the democracy, we've gone down, a, we, 
a rabbit hole of concentrating on anti-monarchist with the Privy Council uh, discussion. What I, what I want to try to do, sorry, I'm hesitating because of this feedback I'm getting, is that um, one of the comrades mentioned earlier about abstraction, uh, Ian, um, the actual thing is that uh, republicanism is not abstraction. Democracy is the abstraction because when you uh, try to uh, operate democracy at ordinary level, and I'm going to take it to trade unions and strikes and things like that, we 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 are gearing ourselves for disappointment on the industrial front because we don't have democracy at grassroots level. Um, it's very difficult to try and speak with this bloody thing. Um, just take strikes for instance. We're allowing the leadership of the trade union to determine the direction of the strikes themselves. Instead of taking control of the strikes at grassroots level by establishing strike committees and appealing to the, to the trade union movement to support that, we are looking continuously at the involvement of trade union bureaucracy to win our battles. Um, whereas strikes are the first opportunity to give us a, uh, a control of our own destiny within the strikes themselves against the government and the employers. Um, when I say that uh, democracy is an abstraction, at the moment we're having elections in our community. And I look at the ballot paper and I've got three conservatives or Tories based on uh, trying to implement austerity within our community. Uh, two of the candidates are Conservative Party and the other one's an independent. Uh, even if we had a Labour Party candidate, they would be loyalists. And this brings us back to the, uh, the comrade that was mentioned, the, the woman that was questioning the Privy Council with Steve, was that um, they're, the House of Commons is based upon loyal, loyalty and loyalists. They're not Republicans. And that's the question that I'm trying to raise and the opportunity of this meeting has given us. We have to understand what type of the, um, democratic republicanism that we're looking for. And Tony keeps confusing the issue, and I, I wonder whether it's purposely, um, by quoting France, America, without looking at the perspective of real workers' democracy. You can't, you can't consider America and France as workers' democracies. So to use that against the idea of democratic republicanism within the trade union working class movement is a, is a correct analysis. Incorrect analysis, sorry. I'm sorry about the hesitation, but it's, I'm having to use my phone to hear you, but, and I can never get the uh, speaker on the iPad that you're um, are coming in on. Anyway, Sorry to hear you've got problems with your technology, but we, I think we got yeah. your point. Thank you, comrade. Um, yeah. Anne, please. Okay. Okay. Um, right, thank you. So, yeah, so I made the comment at the beginning, because I live in Ireland and I'm Irish as you hear. Um, and in Ireland, Cromwell, um, Oliver Cromwell, is a deeply unpopular figure because of the murderous um, expedition he went on across Ireland in the wake of him um, of us coming to power and getting rid of the monarchy. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to make that point that he definitely was and is a deeply unpopular figure um, because of his actions in solidifying 
um, British power over Ireland at the time. But um, what I wanted to mention were two things. Firstly, um, I think that I agree with Tina on the importance of the monarchy for the British state. If it could get rid of the monarchy, um, you know, well, why wouldn't it? I think it wouldn't do it because it's important to it politically in terms of its sustaining power. And also the, the monarchy has powers, as, as Steve mentioned, that which the uh, bureau, bureau, bourgeoisie wants to retain. But you can even see in this run up to the coronation how important it is as a solidifying force, you know, as it seems to me that like lots of people in Britain aren't all that keen on the monarchy, but it doesn't seem that there is any mass movement against the monarchy. It seems that the bourgeoisie have still got the upper hand on that question. Anyway, in terms of Ireland, when the Queen visited Ireland a few years ago, Sinn Féin boycotted her visit um, when she went to the north. Um, but this time, there's a very different response. So comrades will probably know that Michelle O'Neill, First Minister in Northern Ireland, is going to the coronation. Um, how she's painting it is a little bit how she painted it at the time of the funeral when she met, um, when she met with Charles, or I think it was just after the funeral. In any event, was that they, they, um, that they're doing it as a kind of a neighbourly gesture um, rather than an indication of any acceptance of British rule in Northern Ireland. But I think that what they're doing is that they're hoping that by playing ball with the monarchy and not being so militant, that they will manage to persuade them that Sinn Féin is no threat to British, the British state and that uh, United Ireland is no threat and basically that the, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland will allow an All-Ireland referendum for United Ireland. I really think that they're completely wrong on that. I can't see any reason why the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland would do that. But what they are doing also, which is upsetting a lot of Republicans and also, you know, people on the left like myself is that, like that they are reversing what was an honourable tradition of refusing to meet with the monarchy, of basically being anti, anti not only British rule in Northern Ireland, but anti the monarchy and everything it stood for. So, you know, it is a great shame that they're now kowtowing to the monarchy. But what it does, and I'll just finish with this, it, it, it expresses the fact that they want to show that they are no threat. And I think that that's the same with politicians like Jeremy Corbyn and others who do um, do not speak out on the question. I mean, it's a different thing what you have to sign up to. I mean, the, the example of Tommy Sheridan, when he had to take the oath to go into the Scottish Parliament was fantastic and it shows exactly how you can play to your advantage. You remember he had his fist in the air at the same time as he had to do the swearing. Other members of the Scottish Socialist Party made similar gestures which showed that they were, well they didn't turn out like that unfortunately, but showed that the, that the approach they were taking was We'll do whatever it takes, but we're, you know, we're making it clear at the same time that we are going to be rebels. Um, and I think when it comes to the monarchy, a lot of Labour politicians, in fact, perhaps all Labour politicians, um, don't want to take that risk. They don't want to rebel against the monarchy. So anyway, for all those reasons, it seems to me that there's no way the bourgeoisie are going to lop off what seems to me to be an important and intrinsic part of the British state. Thanks, Tina. Thank you. Interestingly, the Social, uh, Scottish Nationalist Party has just uh, come out against the monarchy and said they would they would <laughs> abolish the monarchy if, if Scotland is independent, which is, I think, new as far as I know. And it's probably, probably a, an attempt to save their bacon and not be totally wiped out at the next election. Who knows? But interesting, they've gone the other way. Um, comrades, I've got three more people with a hand up. Do you want to hear them or do you want to come in on something? Shall we just hear them? Let's let's do it. John, please. Thank you, Tina. 
Um, yeah. Um, I, I want to really focus on, on what Ian and Tony have been saying. I mean, Ian put it quite specifically that capitalism doesn't need the monarchy, I think he said. Um, and I think at the global level, uh, yes, uh, capitalism doesn't require a monarchical system of organizing the state. Um, but um, at the level of long established uh, monarchical systems, as in this country, then they constitute an extra barrier and a, a very important extra barrier to actually achieving socialism. And I think this is, this is where the argument of Ian and of Tony, which is that we can get to socialism and deal with the issue of monarchism and republicanism en passant uh, comes in. I, I, I don't accept that. Um, I, I think that it is a very high fence indeed. Where I disagree with Steve on this, well, I don't know whether it's a disagreement, but Steve, Steve gave emphasis to the constitutional aspect rather than the ideological. Um, I, I, I saw a very, very good article, um, I think two days ago, about the ideological uh, aspect of this, which I copied to, to uh, comrades in the Republican Labour. Now, um, the, the, the argument as well that uh, a presidential system, as in uh, Germany, France and the USA, is not what we want either. Well, clearly we don't. Uh, I mean, in, in the same way, as Karl Liebknecht in 1919 in Berlin spoke for a social republic and a mile away, um, Ebert, the SDP leader, was speaking for a bourgeois uh, republic. But neither of those options would have been possible had it not been for the fact that the Kaiser had already been overthrown. And that's really important in the context of German history. Um, so the, those in, 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 um, in, in outline is, is, my, is my critique of what, what has been said by, by Ian and by Tony. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there because we're Thank pressed for time, I think. Thank you, John. Um, okay, we've got Rob now. Hi. Hello. Um, so um, my contribution is really going to be a little um, different than the ones that we made so far. Um, it's really looking at um, kind of the historical study, um, well, historical study from a Marxist perspective, um, and kind of looking at it that way. Um, obviously, we're looking at, you know, you aside from Christopher Hill, as the kind of main, you know, kind of source for the, I, I've said it this before in the chat, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to defend it some more in, in a previous meeting, but I'll say it again. Um, there's a, I think there's a fundamental problem with trying to apply um, post-industrial class relations or, or, you know, industrial class relations to a pre-industrial society. I think that Marx really talks about, you know, the idea that the, the previous thing, uh, society is, you know, um, is, you know, kind of in the womb. Uh, well, the, the next society is in the womb of the previous society, that it is to be birthed by the previous society. And while I, you know, respect that the bourgeois contribution to the English Civil War was significant, I wouldn't say that it was really the breaking point of um, the aristocratic ascendancy in, the, in England, um, because the aristocratic ascendancy continues, continued well into the 19th century. And it didn't go away. You know, the fact that we still have a monarchy is a, is a testament to that. It's a, it's a relic of that time. And, you know, again, it, there is an underplaying of religion and the importance of religion to people in that time. You know, if we're talking about the 17th century, we're looking at a time that was plagued with famine, with war, with disease and with death. You know, and these were the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These were 
the people in that time were genuinely concerned about the end of days and their, the immortality of their souls. And I remember this is a pre-scientific age. This is a time before a widespread rejection of, you know, kind of religion orthodoxy. This is a time when people genuinely believed in an immortal soul. They believed that the Bible was the word of God. And they believed that, and that was, you know, a fundamental part of that struggle that I feel has been left out of this, this conversation. Um, so this kind of brings me forward into, you know, you're right to talk about the French Revolution. I would say that the French Revolution is the first bourgeois revolution because it is significant, you know, it was done specifically with the intention of removing the kind of draconian, um, draconian aristocratic controls over the economy in France. And it was done with that specific purpose. And it was led by members of the bourgeoisie um, with the intention of overthrowing the aristocracy. You can see that that revolution has such a massive impact because of the successive state reforms across Europe after the Napoleonic War, which it's also important to mention that the Napoleonic War was carried out by constitutional monarchies in rejection of the, of the kind of republicanism um, that was promoted by, um, the, the, by the French Revolution and then the kind of state modeling that was modeled, that was presented by Napoleon. It was that threat to their ex existential existence that had to be suppressed. But of course, the efficiency of the French model, the efficiency of that, the, of that division of state was so significant that it became a necessity that all of the European nations adopt that model, that they become, they fall in line if they're going to compete economically. So I think there's, that's, that's an important aspect that we need to kind of take into account when talking about this issue. Um, so we come back to the monarchy and, you know, what is the monarchy? It's a relic of feudalism. You know, it's, it's, it goes right back to you know to the dark ages you know and it is really i think in the 19th century it really became connected with the kind of with with becoming the the figure and the presentation of state and i don't think it has that much material importance to the governance of state it's a big barrier to class consciousness and that's, i think that's why we need to really oppose it wholeheartedly because it swathes of people particularly in this country buy into the idea that the British state is good. Look how good it is because we have, you know, a king or a queen and that that person is there and they're so wonderful and they represent so much of our interests and they, you know, they're a real person, you know, that represents the people. And that, and that is a 19th century kind of occurrence. You know, look at Victoria. Victoria herself wasn't involved in politics, but you can see her face everywhere. And this is the height of bourgeois expansion. It's the height of that development. She is a figurehead. Of that time and that is what the monarchy has become and if you're going to create a communist society a socialist society you need to do away with all vestiges all vestiges of the state and that includes the monarchy whole heart you know without a doubt and i think we're all in agreement of that but let's not you know be under any illusion about what they are and how important they are constitutionally um they are the face of the state and the mind of the, and, the, and, and the, the personification of the state into a single body and not to mention still from a religious perspective to the church of england they are the equivalent of the pope in this country you know and that has a big you know that also has a big impact big impact okay and um, so that's my contribution thank you thank you rob okay the last person to speak is uh victor Good evening, Tina. Hi. We had an interesting discussion about the ethical and moral dilemmas faced by Republicans like Jeremy Corbyn when they joined the Privy Council and swore an oath of allegiance. They didn't pass without criticism for doing so, did they? It reminds me a little bit of what Jesus Christ said about let the first person without sin throw the first stone. I've never been in that fortunate position of having to face a moral dilemma like that. I suspect most of us have not been invited to join the Privy Council and had to decide whether or not to refuse or whether or not to sign an oath of loyalty to the current monarch. I did, however, face another ethical dilemma, and this one came to the fore when I decided I had to support Jeremy Corbyn against the Blairite counter coup. 
I happily joined Momentum because I thought that was a vehicle for supporting Jeremy Corbyn. I have some regrets now, but I didn't see it then. I refused at the time to join membership of my local Blairite Leno party, that's Labour in name only, because that meant signing an undertaking that I would not support any candidates who stood against my Blairite politicians who dominate the part of London in which I live. And in conscience, I couldn't do that. I can't walk past people dying on the streets for want of a cardboard box to keep warm in and carry on as if nothing had happened, being a member of a local organisation that was responsible for them not having any, any council housing to move into. I wonder if those who criticise Jeremy have similar high principles, whether they would also undertake never ever to support or sign any declaration of loyalty that means supporting or not opposing Blairite Leno party candidates, war criminals or their collaborators. I made my moral stand. How about the other critics of Jeremy's uh, uh, a role in the Privy Council, making a similar stand. Thank you for allowing me to make an interesting point, Tina. Thank you. Even if you say so yourself. Thank you, Victor. Um, okay, comrades, thank you for your contributions from the floor. I suggest we're doing it in reverse order and start with Steve and finish up with Ian. I think I've had so many comments that I can't really go and do, answer everyone everyone's points in in principle. Although I did take notes, not note, did take notes as people were speaking. Um, so I'll just try to sum up what I think is that some of the some of the some some of the critics uh, didn't actually understand the importance of the point I was some of the points I was making, which are absolutely. I said you need to draw a demarcation line between the king the monarch and the crown and everybody many comrades spoke as if they're the same thing they didn't they were they were the same thing in the 14th century i mean the king was the crown in the 14th century you couldn't tell one from the other it was the same thing after 1649 when they chopped the king's head off the crown emerged as a separate corporate body in the late 17th century and became something different the king and the crown was no longer the same thing and the crown is the power of the state. It's not a feudal power, by the way. It's the power of a massive corporate body, which employs millions of people, that has tax raising powers, that has guns and weapons, that has judges, that has armed forces, that has police. It's huge. It's, a, it's the biggest multinational corporation, because it's got branches all over the world, by the way. It's the biggest multinational corporation in the country. And if we don't deal with that and we start keep calling it the king, then we're really going right the way in the wrong direction. And so that's my, and part of my answer to Tony, Tony Greenstein is Tony doesn't see the difference between the two of those things. Of course, the crown needs to have a king to sit on the top of it. The king is merely the head of the crown, but the crown is not the king. And so it is really, really important to see that because you have to, because really well, they've set the king up to make everybody look in the wrong direction. Well, we're busy looking at the king and thinking, well, it's all ideological and he doesn't do much. He just wanders about. He doesn't do any harm. What's the point in getting rid of him? Right. That which is what the which what the anti monarchists say. Well, we should get rid of him. But the power that we have to deal with is the power of the crown. So that's the first point. The second point is that Tony hasn't understood the difference between a liberal republic and a democratic republic. Well, what the hell's a democratic republic? Well, they are, it's democratic. And what does that mean then? It means that all power comes from below. In the Paris Commune, we saw the idea of a democratic republic where, where sovereignty was vested in the people, government of the people, by the people, uh, for the people. Abraham Lincoln said that, but he never made it real. 
uh, it was it was the working class movement that can turn that idea into reality by creating a democratic republic. And so the question was raised, is the democratic republic the same as the dictatorship of the proletariat? And I think you can get to the point of saying Lenin's answer to that in State and Revolution was the democratic republic was the closest you could get to the dictatorship of the proletariat. And in fact, it wouldn't would grow into the other. I mean, you could take that answer or you could say, well, to be honest, if the working, if working people get, make everybody elected accountable and subject to control, that is a dictatorship, not in the sense of absence of democracy, but in the sense of the democratic power of the people being the thing that actually decides what goes on. Now, in theory, in theory, we could keep capitalism and have a democratic republic, but you know what? If we did that, <laughs> capitalism would destroy it within about 10 seconds. You couldn't possibly have a, 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 a system that was so democratic that you wouldn't have to begin immediately to start take, like, taking, making inroads into property ownership. It would, one would flow directly into another. So in that sense, a democratic republic would become social. And I suppose, um, going back, I think the Russian Revolution should have taught us to draw a distinction between a social republic, a democratic and social republic, and socialism in one country. The Russian Revolution said you can't have socialism. It approved, I think, you can't have socialism in one country. And I'm not an advocate of socialism in one country. That has to be something international. So I think the, the farthest we could go was create a thoroughly democratic state. And we would, we would have own a considerable amount of the property, if not all, not all of it would be brought. But the people would decide how much private and public they wanted to have. I mean, that's, that's what they would do. And again, it wouldn't stay there because it would have to go international. So it would be a step to something international. As Ian, as Ian would say, you know, you can't get rid of capitalism in one country either. So if, we, if you stay in one country, you are sunk. So I think I want to say, I agree with what John said, John Schumann. My point, John, in response to you was, uh, you're right, I didn't emphasize ideological because everybody emphasized the ideological power of the monarchy, right? I was trying to say, I was emphasizing constitutional because that's the bit that everybody forgets about and never discusses and thinks it doesn't really count. And in fact, it does count, as Tony Benn explained, it counts in oaths, it counts in decision-making, it counts in power. The reason that we, you're absolutely right, capitalism doesn't need to have a monarchy, but you're right, in the historical specific evolution of this country, the monarchy is absolutely the center of the ruling class and the system of power in this country. And you can't challenge that at all without doing that. My last point, Tina, before I get lost now, the last point I think is, and my point about Jeremy Corbyn is not a moral question. I'm not shooting him down for being somebody who betrayed his principles. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if a movement doesn't start out as a Republican movement, if it starts out saying, well, we're gonna return the country to what it was like in 1945, with a social monarchy, then you are gonna get trapped into the structures of power. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what happened to Jeremy Corbyn. It's a political criticism, not a moral. You know, I, I'm not saying, oh, well, you know, I wouldn't have done that. I'd probably be worse than Jeremy. I would have probably betrayed everybody. So, you know, that, but if I did that, you'd all throw me out and go, well, I'm not having anything to do with you anymore. So that's fine. In a democratic movement, if people betray, betray what they're saying, then the movement just boots them out and gets somebody else in instead. And that's democracy for you. Thanks, Steve. He could have also used, of course, what he learned in the Privy Council to inform the workers' movement or yeah, something. But that, like he's that. not allowed to do that. He, he took the, that kid of his answer to you. He's not yeah. allowed to do that by the oath. The oath was set up precisely so he couldn't do that. You what know happens what I mean? then? So, so, prison or what? And just, <laughs> um, I won't make, sorry, one little other point. It's important to note, by the way, that Charles Bradlaugh in the 19th century was a kind of Republican with the name like Sir Charles Bradlaugh. But Bradlaugh refused to... Um, take an oath to, the, to, to, to God. It was a religious thing. And so they kicked him out of the House of Commons because he wouldn't swear to the House. So he went back to his constituency in Northampton and he fought an election and his electors put him back in again. He said, no, we're voting for you anyway. So he went back to the House of Commons. They threw him out again. He went back to Northampton, fought the election again. And at that point, his, his majority went up and up and up on every single occasion as people rallied him and eventually, they, they decided in the House of Commons that they better allow people to affirm and not make them swear to God. 
So he showed by, that by struggle, by, by believing in the people, by winning the arguments amongst the people, and that's what Republicans could do, by the way, if they took a, a leaf out of Charles, Brad, Charles Bradlaugh's book, went to the door of the House of Commons, we're not going in, and if you won't let us in without swearing over allegiance, we're going back to our constituency, we'll call an election and fight it out there. What's wrong with that as a strategy? It's much better than just going in and go, well, put my hands behind the back and lied about it. No, I don't think that's going to work. What about the fist in the air, like Ch Anne mentioned, Thomas No, uh, That's just a, that's that's more militant nothingness, okay? <laughs> militant nothingness. And then you can speak against the monarchy when you have your platform in Parliament. Yeah, and then they say, what a hypocrite you are, because you swore an oath of allegiance, and now you've got up in Parliament, so they'll always have you at that point. You're a hypocrite. You wanted, you wanted to get your 60k, your 80k, or whatever it was. You prepare to swear an oath to get your 80k. You're not really that much. They, yeah, they would have you buy, they'd have you buy your short and curlies at that point. Uh, I think it, that, that sounds a bit more realistic. I think you can do good work and, you know, use Parliament as a as a platform and even you know, it's a, it's an oath that's not going to, you know, you don't lose yourself unless you, you know, you, you have no polit well, politics to start with. I mean, Tony Benn said that it's, you, you, but people think an oath doesn't really count for anything. And what he said, it's law. And, 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 and his point, and he's, he's been there and done it, his point was it's much more powerful than you realise. It's like you going into the jury and saying, I'm now going to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you start lying when you're standing in the witness box, you'll be in, you'll be in the mix faster than you can do. It, you, when you make that oath, you have to try to, to do it. You know what I mean? It's, it's more powerful than people think of an oath. That's why we have to have oaths for that very reason, because it's quite powerful. Mm -hmm. No, anyway, we'll disagree. Okay, we've got to, actually before I bring in Ian, um, we've just had a quick hand up. So I'm suggesting we just quickly hear um, Cheryl. If you have a short point, that would be good. Oh. You're still muted. Still mute, comrade. Sorry, Cheryl, you're still muted. Mm. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry. Um, I don't quite understand um, Steve's point, this whole business about... Uh, well, I understand that there is, you know, the constitute... As I'm a lawyer, I understand that lots of our laws relate from you know, years ago, et cetera. And they, they're, but they're part and parcel of our legal system, which is a capitalist legal system. I don't see why you, you seem to elevate them to having some kind of special separate status as, a, as, as part of your argument. To me, they all, they're all part and parcel of the whole, whole system that operates. Yeah, that was just my quick point. Can I can I quickly answer that, Tina, to say, and I like that the Germans have got the right idea about this, so that's what I mentioned that, Tina, but the, the Germans call their constitution the basic law, or the law of laws, or the law for making laws. So in that sense, constitutional law is very, very important in that sense. It's the law by which we make laws. And that, that's the way I'd understand it. And therefore, you've got to take really notice of the ways in which laws made. Uh, mm -hmm. If we don't take notes of the ways in which law is made, we're going to get all sorts of, well, we get the kind of laws we've got. <laughs> Nobody just take notice of the Constitution and look at all the bad laws we've got, you know. I, hope that, I don't know if that answers it, but that's my, that's my take on it. Over it's, to, it's, it's a special law, really. It's the basic law of the country. Over to Ian to sum up now. What I've tried to argue, really, is that capitalism is historically recent historically specific and therefore historically transient. So are kings, kings, queens, whatever. But monarchy itself um, it, it was tied really to a, a feudal mode of production. And the only reason why our, monarch, our monarchy, the British monarchy survives is precisely because it was separated off from having any real political power. It was the, I tried to find the origin of the doctrine of the king's two bodies the notion that the, the king has a natural body as well, which is subject to all the corruption of, of ageing and death, and then the body politic. And I think that's also part of what Steve's alluded to in terms of talking about the crown and the king. 
So the idea of the, the body politic survives even if the king dies. However, um, coming back to the question of the English Revolution, oaths are an interesting thing. I mean, the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, um, refuse on principle to take oaths. And actually, if you read your New Testament, they have a very good sound argument for it. Um, if, 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 <laughs> Jesus is very, very open about the fact that you should not swear. <laughs> you should just tell the truth and you don't need to swear. So the Quakers had a, a theological basis, but the theological basis for refusing to take oaths was also rooted in their political stance. Um, what would I do? I don't know. I think I would try and assess the situation, whether it was more useful to have a workers' tribune in a stinking charnel house like the House of Commons, whether it's worth making the, 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 the sacrifice of, of making the oath. I'd like to think I wouldn't, but I, I would depend on the circumstances. I think you have to just use what's there at the time and make that, that judgment, rightly or wrongly, perhaps. Um, so in terms of democracy, I think what socialism is, con should be, is concerned with is direct participative democracy rather than representative democracy. That doesn't mean to say there wouldn't be delegates or whatever, but they're, they're so, the whole point is that every aspect of human society can be controlled by the people who are subject to that. It's not a question of anybody being the subjects of a, a democratic republic or indeed monarchy. It's about the... Uh, direct participative democracy and the workers need to control all of society and indeed the unions as well. Unions now have become little more than specialist branches of human relations departments. And um, So coming on to Anne's point about uh, Cromwell in Ireland, I'm not going to defend Cromwell's actions at Jockard or Wexford or anywhere else for that matter. But there are some interesting comments from Irish historians which have pointed out that really um, Cromwell was doing what people did in those days. That is to say, you demand the surrender of the town. And if they surrender, you're spared. And if you don't, everybody who's bearing arms is killed. And some historians have argued that most of the people slaughtered at Wexford and Jockard were really royalists. More, so it wasn't so much a slaughter of the Irish, but a slaughter of, of royalists. The crimes of Cromwell go far greater, deeper than that, of course, in the sense that many of his soldiers and officers were effectively paid with bits of Ireland. Uh, the transplantation, uh, in, particularly in Ulster, of course, um, and of course you see it symbolised all over uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, there's a Cromwell Street and an Ireton Street right next to one another in Belfast. Um, there are lots of references to the, uh, the Cromwell, Cromwell's army. Um, again, I'm not d defending Cromwell, but it's a question of what was what did Cromwell represent, um, which of course brings me neatly on to Rob. Um, in, in arguing that it was a bourgeois revolution, it's not, uh, as I say, it's not, it's not about um, the question of who was taking part. I mean, Marx clearly thought it was a bourgeois revolution. Quite apart from Christopher Hill, the and whether it's the transition from feudalism to capitalism wasn't a moment. It wasn't a, a moment like the French Revolution. It wasn't a moment like the English Revolution. The, the trans. I mean, you, you can think of the English Revolution as being something which had its origins in the Tudor dynasty, and then ultimately in um, the dissolution of the monasteries. But actually, what's at the, the, at the at the heart of that is a transition from um, feudal uh, production with peasants who maybe pay a part of their surplus in the form of corvée, uh, forced labour, as it were, or a proportion of their, um, their surplus paid to the, the, the feudal lord, uh, and a transition away from that to um, agriculture for the market. Uh, and so therefore uh, you, you end up with a, a, a bourgeois um, um, land-owning class uh, that's producing for the market, which is taking on uh, uh, landless labourers to to and, and extracting a surplus in the form of of surplus value in the same way that a, a, a car factory worker would be today. Um, so, John Tuman, I, I obviously didn't express myself very well. I, I think 
the monarchy is crucially important and, and, it, and the sooner it's done away with the better. I think all I'm saying really is that there are plenty of republics about which are thoroughly bourgeois and, and, and don't seem to, it doesn't seem to matter whether they've got a king or not, they're still bourgeois republic. But in the context of Britain, why I think it's important and why I think this meeting is important is to say, well, let's imagine, you know, when my mum told me about the coronation in, in 1953, and I look at what she described and I look at the accounts of that and I look at what we see now with the most dysfunctional family in Britain um, being invested as as a head of state, um, and you see, well, it's in decline. The abolition of the monarchy in the context of Britain is may have a revolutionary potential. If you can, it, if you look at every attempt to have even very modest reforms in recent years has been blocked, uh, whether by the Tory party or the Labour party. Every, why? Because I, I think that the concession of any significant concessions uh, would lead to a demand for more. And, I, and the, the, an extension of democracy of doing away with the absurdity of a hereditary head of state would have a revolutionary consequence. I don't mean it would lead automatically to a socialist revolution, but it might well lead to demands for even further democratization. One of the great things, I mean, Cromwell didn't start off as a regicide. And, and, and most of the people who took part in the English Revolution um, didn't in, intend to do away with Charles I. They would have been quite happy if he had just complied uh, and, and, and given Parliament its, its, its rightful place. His own stupidity, this important interaction between accident and necessity, the foolishness of Charles I bringing about his own decline, was on the basis of the necessity in the development of history of capitalist relations of production already existing in the context of 17th century English society. So, comrades, I've thoroughly enjoyed this evening and, and I'm looking forward to the most dysfunctional family in Britain being, you know, the monarchy has to be done away with if only in the interests of the royal family, never mind us. Uh, and mm. in the meantime, their abolition, uh, I believe, might bring about a significant movement to, in the direction of socialism and democracy. Thank you. Absolutely. Good, good finish. I think the, the abolition of the monarchy is not the end for us, but it would be the beginning of, of, of more. And of, you know, once you imagine once you've you've been able as a movement from below to do away with such an important institution, can you imagine what other things you you would we would be able to to achieve? Um, so it's from you know I think from our point of view it's important to take these questions very seriously, political questions, how we're ruled. It's not it's not for them, you know. It's not got nothing to do with us. It's not boring. It has to be part of the Marxist program for change for socialism. If you if we just don't leave anything to the ruling class. These are all our questions that the working class has to have answers for because they are so crucial to how society works, how capitalism works. So that was a really interesting discussion with a bit of um, disagreement, which also always makes it a bit more interesting. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Ian, and for, for everybody who's come in and contributed to the debate. The next two, two sessions will be led by Roger Silverman, who, if you were there last week, has volunteered kindly to not just look at the first international, which he did last week, but then also look at the second and the third. So we have an, a little package of, of the three internationals and what happened with them and how they went wrong and perhaps how we have to do it differently. And the fact that, you know, we are um, it's in, in, in a really dangerous period where World War Three looks more real uh, than it has been for decades really, really uh, stresses that that point that we need to get clear our heads around how could we actually unite the working class on an international level and what went wrong in the past and how we do it better. So thank you, comrades. We hope you join us next Thursday with Roger Silverman. Good night. <laughs>